Well, good morning, uh, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in Google. Um, this is a, a familiar venue for me, and I hope for all of you as well. We, um, we occasionally get to visit with people who are probably more consequential than anybody else in the world, or pretty close. And in my career, I've had an opportunity to, to visit and know one or two or three or four such people. Vint Cerf, for example, invented the internet. It may very well be that Salman Khan becomes the most important educator in the entire world. We will see. <laughs> <laughs> but to imagine the potential that this gentleman has in terms of changing the world ahead of us literally gives me goosebumps to think of the impact that his invention and his approach can have for billions of people. It is an honor and a privilege to have you here at Google. Oh, it's great oh. to be here, and I, and I like the, the low expectations that <laughs> set for me. So I think as, as this audience pretty much knows Saul's story, but for those who may not know, um, this is a gentleman who should have done something else. Brilliant mathematician, physics, everything you could imagine, on his way to the most lucrative possible job running hedge funds here in New York. I think second most lucrative after, well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes. and, and somehow, right at that point, he made a decision that changed his life, his family's life, and I think literally everyone else's. You want to talk about how you got into the video YouTube business big time. Yeah, so a lot of y'all might know the, the initial, I guess, Genesis story. I was uh, working with my cousins remotely. Initially, I was in Boston. Then uh, the firm that I was working for, it, it, well, it was, it was me, my boss, who was our portfolio manager, and his dog. The dog was the chief economist. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, his wife became a professor at Stanford Law, so that we moved out to Silicon Valley. And then uh, uh, while I was tutoring all of my cousins remotely, and I started working on the, the interactive part, which is you know the, the questions and the quizzing and keeping track of students. And I didn't think about the video at all at that point. This was, uh, this was or kind of fall of 2006. I was showing this to a friend in, uh, in, in, in Silicon Valley and, and, and you know, the software part I was showing, and, and he said, oh, this is great and everything. And I said, but my problem is I'm having trouble keeping up with all of these cousins and everything. And, and he's the one that recommended, well, there's this thing called YouTube. And I was like, yeah, I've kind of heard of it. Uh, and, and you want you make some tutorials, put it on that. And I was like, no, 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 YouTube's for, for cats playing piano. It's not for uh, math. And, uh, but I, I got over the idea that it wasn't my idea. And I, uh, I gave it a shot. And uh, you know, like I think a lot of stories that y'all are familiar with on YouTube, I'm not quite at Justin Bieber scale yet, but the, um, the, you know, the, the, a lot the people started watching it. And by 2009, uh, had, had set it up as a not-for-profit in 2008. And then 2009, uh, as you described, kind of, it, 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 it was already taking over my life. And at that point, it, there was no way I could so, do anything So else. it's really all about YouTube. It, it is. Okay. <laughs> It, yeah, I mean, you know, I can't, uh, I don't think. I, I, I uh, think it, frankly, you should just thank YouTube. I, sh I should, <laughs> I, I should, I should just thank YouTube. That's right. So content, you know, you just, if it had not existed, you would be like nothing. That's, that, I would, I would just be You'd one be like of those. You'd be like making lots of money in hedge Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. <laughs> so what happened was we had this wonderful scenario where YouTube created a platform and then you decided to start working on math. How did this idea go from the, the, the first with your cousin, I think, and how did it go to being all of high school, all of everything? Yeah, it's an interesting, you know, when I started this, uh, you know, fall of 2006, early 2007, like everyone else, you know, Wikipedia was already out there, and you're like, oh, anything substantive is going to be the crowd, or it's definitely going to be multiple people. When you just think about uh, K through 12, or if you, you know, our content is actually more K through 14, or it goes into college, but it seems like this huge amount of content. You know, if you look at the textbooks, each of these courses, they're like these thousand page textbooks. And so I immediately started, well, I'm just gonna do these as a proof of concept and I will then get my friends or people I know to kind of join in, we can do this together. And then maybe collectively 20 of us might be able to tackle algebra. Uh, but, but once I started doing it, you know, I, I made about 80 videos initially and I was like, you know, that's, it's not 100% comprehensive, but 
it gives someone, if someone watches those and understands this, that's a pretty good scaffold and, of algebra. And, and it's important for those, those of you who are not studying high school algebra at the moment, that these are in fact very simple videos, right? It, it, they're, they're shot with just a little... Uh, yeah, no, I mean, when, I, when I started doing it, you know, I was like, well, these are for my cousins. Um, I don't feel like buying a video camera. Um, and uh, I didn't feel like buying anything fancy, so I literally used a USB headset and uh, Microsoft Paint. Uh, I didn't even look to see we if there was something. Products. I know I've learned that. <laughs> I've learned that I now use another free program uh, that is everything pressure. Everything at Google is free. Oh yes, me. yes, that is that is that is pressure. But but anyway, um, <laughs> uh, and and I, I started making them, and, and they were really just you know you saw my little scrawls and the the first few ones. I, I actually cringe when I look at the older ones, but some people say, oh, I really like that. It felt very homespun type of thing. But uh, yeah, they're kind of the shaky handwriting, and 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 you hear my voiceover. And, uh, but, you know, it became clear, you know, a lot of people think content goes stale fast. And it's true, you know, if you're writing a blog, if you're doing a news site, every day you got to have it. And people say, oh, content doesn't scale. But, uh, you know, with stuff like algebra, those 80 videos, and it took me like a month to do them, it was kind of like, that, that's kind of algebra. And then I kept, I kept going and, you know, it, it eventually became like this Forrest Gump type, you know, can I race across America type of adventure. And I said, well, I'm going to do all of, K I'm going to do all of mathematics. And, 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 and so we're clear, he didn't stop when he did all of mathematics. Yes, what's no. next after mathematics? Yeah, was? so, well, the, the physics was close to my heart. Then okay, the, that was the, easy for the, you. Yeah, okay, that was, what was uh, the next one? The, then then I, I was an analyst at a hedge fund. And, you know, it was funny because everyone... So how about the, you did this origins of the financial disaster video? Yes, and people now, should look at... That or, who, was the, who was the target for that one? It was for people I meet at cocktail parties. Because people say, you're an analyst at a, at a hedge fund. And, and I was actually like a huge housing bear in like 2005, 2006, 2007. And like everybody says, oh, how come you haven't bought a house yet? You know, they, only, they can only go up. And you could, uh, and, I, and I would say, let me explain it to you. Actually, that used to be my interview questions when I used to interview someone at a hedge fund. I would say, should I rent or buy? And they would say, you should buy. I was like, I haven't even told you the price yet. And, 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 and then there's like, and they're like, okay, okay. And, 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 and you just keep going and they're like, okay, the rent is this, this is that, this is the house, it's a million dollars, should I rent or buy? Or you should buy that. Okay, now the house is two million dollars, should I rent, the rent hasn't changed. Should you rent or buy? And so I felt that needed some explanation to the world, that there is a, a way of thinking about this type of a problem. Um, and then, you know, when the, and then I, I did a whole thing uh, my about My guess the, is none of the hedge funds managers have actually watched your seven minute video. They're too, <laughs> they're too embarrassed to learn from YouTube and you. Uh, some of them have actually to, uh, been more forthright. Uh, during the financial crisis, I did get a letter, and I won't say which bank, <laughs> from someone who said, uh, you know, thank you for the video on mortgage-backed securities. I now know what I do for a living, <laughs> which, which was very, I thought, you know, better late than never. It's, uh, it's, By the uh, way, it's important to know that, that Sal has just organized a computer science program. So those of you who are computer scientists, you have an opportunity to learn about computer science. <laughs> I, I don't think, yes. I think uh, the folks here will, will anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, what ha there's a very interesting story that is the transition from you as sort of an, at some point you ran out of USB camera time and the and sort of the time sitting in your apart your your apartment and you sort of wanted to found and and Khan Academy is is a nonprofit by the way so tell us through how did you how did you go to being a significant organization how did you get funded how did you get your board set yeah so uh, you know. I, there was one foundation that was in 2008 that was saying, oh, are you a not-for-profit? I'm like, yeah, well, that, what's a not-for-profit? That's my intention. And they, they told me, no, it's, it's a thing. You'd have to file it, become a corporation, then file with the IRS. And, um, and I said, oh, I'm going to do it. And I, I, I originally, I called up some law firm, and they said it was $20,000 to do that. Um, then I found some people in Tennessee who did it over the internet uh, for, for, for $2,000. They're actually very good. Uh, anyone, well, actually, I, I, I'll be a referral for them at any point. But the, uh, uh, so they set it up. That foundation didn't end up supporting Khan Academy. Uh, then in 2009, uh, when I'd quit my job, I started to think about it more seriously. Because uh, you didn't have money for the rent. Because I didn't have, yes. And you had failed to purchase a house. Yes, I didn't have a house, and um, not having money makes you think, take things seriously. Uh, and, and, and I started pitching to a bunch of foundations and philanthropists. And it was uh, in uh, May of 2010 that, you know, it, famously, Ann Doerr sent that $10,000 check, and I immediately emailed her back and saying, 
You know, if we were a physical school, you would not have a building named after you. Um, <laughs> that, that was the largest donation ever gotten. The rest were like, before that was like $50 was the biggest <laughs> donation. And then uh, we famously, you know, we, we met in, in downtown Palo Alto and, and she said, well, you know, what's your vision? I said, well, it's a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. And she said, well, that's a modest ambition. Um, <laughs> and, and what does it envision? And, uh, it, well, and actually at around the same time, I had some initial talks with Google as well. Right. And we were, we were kind of, uh, and, and this is what I was telling everyone. I was like, you know, I want to keep making these videos. Uh, I want to, I want to uh, uh, we can translate them into the languages of the world. We can create an interactive platform. We can have a community of learners. And, and she was, you know, when I, she, and she said, well, that's interesting. And how are you supporting yourself? And, and I said, I'm not. Um, <laughs> and, and then when she, when I went home, she, she wrote that, that first, you know, she, she sent a wire of her text, you know, you should be supporting yourself. I've just wired you $100,000. Uh, so, so it was a good day. Uh, <laughs> that was, uh, and then, and then it was really uh, later that summer that, it, and it all came to, you know, I was talking to Google this entire time, and I didn't realize that it was all about this 10 to the 100th project. And it was really at the end of uh, that summer that, that uh, the, the Google folks said, well, what would you do with $2 million? And, 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 you know, I said, well, you know, is this an open question? Because there's, I could buy some. It's like things. an interview question. Yeah, I could be, exactly. Uh, but, you know, and it was really the, the same uh, pitch that I, that I told Anne. And so, it, you know, by that fall, they, they were really, I mean, they were the, really the first, at that point, it was the largest donation is, is the two million. And Bill Gates yeah. Foundation was also a significant. Yep, one. right out the gate in that fall of 2010, it was a Google two million, Gates Foundation, same order of magnitude. Uh, you know, get our first office space. At the time, it was to hire a team of five people and uh, start translating it into to the different languages and build a software platform. Yeah. So, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and I want to credit Ann Doerr. Um, Ann, who I've known for many, many years, is uh, John, John Doerr's wife, is on our board, saw this and immediately understood the scale of what this could be. And, and you know, I've told her, I think this may be the single most important professional thing she ever does at the scale that you're now operating. Um, and she's been fantastic as a supporter. And I've recently joined the board, so in the spirit of full disclosure. The, uh, and obviously I've been a supporter. The, the interesting thing is that there was a point at which you decided, you went from, hey, I'm making really interesting videos. What, what happened in the US was that Moms and dads, mostly moms who had sort of, you know, preteen kids, started watching these videos and it was completely word of mouth. And so you'd hear this, right? And you'd hear it in your corner. I said, like, who is Khan Academy? Like, not, there's a different Khan that's like a politician. And the ba there's a Bollywood actor, yes. <laughs> He's somewhat, somewhat well known. But yeah. Okay, so anyway, so, you know, it's sort of it's one of those underground kind of viral things and it, it worked. And that was where the, I think the word of mouth really, really started. And then with the Google grant, you got this opportunity to do the international thing. But then something interesting happened. Somehow you decided to, to change the way education worked, or at least run the experiment. And you showed up in Los Altos. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it was is where you you live in Los Altos. So you sort of say, yeah. "Hey, I want to change the school system in my local yeah. district." No, I live in Mountain View, but obviously, I live literally like a hundred meters away from. So they're the the adjacent school district. And when you know, when we got the first grants from the Gates Foundation and and Google, uh, we still view this. You know, none of the that initial pitch was about thinking about transforming physical schools or thinking about what education could become or what happens with higher education. We were just like, no, through virtual means, we're going to do the best we can to see how we can deliver knowledge and interactivity and whatever else. But right when we did that, Los Altos came to us and said, well, we heard some stuff about what you're doing. Maybe it could be used in a, in a physical school. So uh, what would you do? But was it really your idea or really sort of a joint idea? Or is it some it was, superintendent it was actually, who was clever? It was Mark Goins, who's a fairly okay. prominent uh, angel investor in, in, in the Valley, who was on the board of Los Altos. Huh. And we just uh, we were introduced by I think someone at the Gates. Just you know, he's an interesting guy to talk to, a good advisor, and a great guy. We 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 you know we met at that at that uh, Pete's Coffee on Castro, uh, you know, right on the. And uh, at the end of it, he's like, "Oh, I'm on the board of Los Altos. I'd love to meet, have you meet the the superintendent and the assistant superintendent." And and then when we chatted, they said, "Well, what would you do with a fifth grade classroom?" And uh, said. Now that there are ways to get lecture other than a traditional physical lecture, um, now uh, now that there are ways to get interactive problem solving and give student teachers data, I, I wouldn't have classroom based on lectures anymore. I would have 
uh, every student, and when you, as soon as you, it's not based on lecture, then it doesn't have to be at the same pace anymore either. So have every student working at their own pace, teachers get information about it, and, uh, and, and are able to intervene in a very personal way with students, or have the students intervene with each other in a personal way. And, you know, I thought this was a very theoretical conversation, it's let me dream big, and uh, they, they came back literally three days later, said, well, this is a great idea, let's try it, we want to try it in four classrooms. By the way, this never happens. This. Okay. This is like, you know, a meteorite hit. That's how ra random this is. No, and it was funny, because right when they said that, I was like, oh, that's you, great. You must have done a pretty good job of pitching this. Perhaps. I don't know. I mean, I think I, it's one of those, uh, you know, I, I don't know what they saw. I guess it was good. Some I mean, random just, guy walks up and says, let's redo yeah. the, I mean, come we, on. We had been recently validated by some well-known, uh, but it's true. I mean, it was funny, because right after they told me that, I was looking, by the way, can we lease some office space from you? Uh, we ended up going to downtown Mountain View, but uh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't even know where I was. I, that was, I think the, I, our president now, Shantanu, had either was about to join or had just joined from McKinsey to, to kind of help out. But yeah, we didn't know where our office space was. We didn't, hadn't hired our team yet, but yeah, it was very early days. And we were shocked because it's a public so, school so district. The, so, so Saul actually came to, came to Google and actually sort of explained his model and a number of us were part of it. And, and the most interesting thing that has be become sort of the overall narrative is the inversion of the classroom. Can you explain, explain that idea and does it really work? Yeah, so you know, this Los Altos thing ended up working wonderfully, especially in the early days. You know, we didn't have the data in the early days, uh, uh, the, the test score data, but we anecdotally, you know, famously the kids didn't want to go to recess anymore. It was super interactive. The parents were enjoy uh, the teachers were enjoying themselves. And uh, uh, this also never happened. <laughs> this, uh, and, and it was um, in, in that April uh, invited to TED to speak. And so I was like, look, you know, we're going to talk about this interesting thing that's happening at Los Altos. And uh, during that TED talk, kind of in the, in the run up to talking about Los Altos, which, is, which was really taking it a lot further than kind of the flipped classroom that I, I, I think is being alluded to. Um, I talked about even in 2007, 2008, I did get emails from teachers who were saying, look, you've already given a, a competent lecture, an interesting lecture about factoring polynomials or how does meiosis work or why does borrowing make sense or who knows what it might be. Uh, I don't need to give that lecture anymore. Students can watch it at their own time, their own pace. They get the benefits that my cousins had. You know, if you're in an algebra class and you forgot how to add fractions, you will not raise your hand and say, excuse me, I forgot how to raise, uh, now you can do it without any shame. And then they could use class time for actual problem solving. So what used to be homework, problem solving, can now be done with the context of peers and your teacher. Um, uh, you have people to help you. By helping other people, you'll learn more. And that used to be that one pace, very, you know, very passive lecture, could now be a somewhat more active lecture. You could pause if you don't understand a term, watch another video, remediate. Uh, what, what we hope now, and, Los, and, the, and that's what the TED Talk kind of the next few minutes of it went into, well, that's great. Now we can take it even further with uh, every student learning at their own pace. When, what it was interesting about the res first results, and I remember this very clearly, was you gave the example of, you know, little Johnny or whatever, who got stuck on a particular kind of fractions and loses the rest of the year because that building block is yeah. needed for the subsequent work. Yeah. And so there's evidence that in traditional learning, the kid gets stuck and they never catch up. Yeah. Whereas in your model, they, they take a little bit extra time because you know, it's hard or yeah. for, them, for whatever reason. And there is uh, data that indicates that they ultimately do better than the median. Yeah, no. And that's yeah. extraordinary. Yeah, it, it's blown our minds. And, and, and on some level, it's been like, oh my God, this is an ama amazing thing. But on a whole other dimension, it's completely common sense. You know, I, I write a lot in, in the book about um, you know, one example that this past year we've been working in Oakland, and it's a it's a charter school. These kids are signed up for essentially a, a pre-algebra class. It's their sixth and seventh graders, and then as soon as they started working on. Khan Academy, we were able to look in the data in real time and say, wow, you know, some of these kids don't know their multiplication tables. Some of these kids don't know how to add decimals. And in a traditional model, they're in an algebra class. They're in a pre-algebra class. You do algebra. Even if, and the teacher knew this too. The teacher knew that there were these core weaknesses because these students were just kept being promoted along even though they had these gaps in their knowledge. And then at some point when they're just not getting algebra, it has nothing to do with the algebra. It's just because they, they, they can't even understand what's, what's going on. And so when we kind of did it the other way around, uh, and, and even in this case in Oakland and earlier in Los Altos, and, and the most interesting data came from a remedial math class. 
Uh, when we let these students work at their own pace, yeah, right in the beginning there were these group of kids that just raced ahead and you'd say, oh, those, those are the gifted kids, they'll go work at Google one day. Um, and and oh, here are the slower kids, you know, that's, there, there are other things that they can do. Um, but, but what, what you, and in a traditional school system, that's how you do it, it's usually around middle school, you track them. And but what we see is if you let this group over here work at their own pace, a lot of it was remediation, uh, picking up stuff that they really should have learned, but they've got, a, you know, in the old system, you get a C, that's fine, that's passing, you go to the next thing, even though you have a gap. And they were able to fill in all those gaps and really get mastery at them. That same kid that you thought was weak six months ago is now the best student in the class. And we're seeing that over and over again. What I'd like to do is now is explore a little bit about where this goes. Um, the, the first question is, what, uh, this is a, an analytical group by any measure, what are the provably true things that we could say today based on the numbers that you, the, the activities you've done? We know, we know that there's a lot of, of anecdotal evidence that yes. people do better with your videos and parents yeah. around the world are yeah. celebrating this. Yeah. What sort of science is behind your success? Yeah, so the provably true statements are the, the ones, I could say this, every, and it's very different depending on which school. So, you know, I don't want to make a blanket statement that Khan Academy will always improve test scores by 25% or, I guess I could say, or your money back because it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's free. Um, uh, but, but in the ones that we've studied, uh, Los Altos, so what's, well, Los Altos, Oakland Unity, Summit, uh, KIPP, is that we've seen fairly substantial, you know, not one to two percent changes, uh, but you know, in the case of Oakland, we saw an order of magnitude change okay. in in the number of students who are performing at kind of a proficient level in the uh, remedial class in in Los Altos. You know, not just based on our own data. You know, I talk about that kid who was slow and speed up on the, the California test scores. Clearly, to be placed in a, in a in a remedial class, they were well below average. All of them, some of them, severely below average. Uh, but then after this. Uh, there were a few kids that were advanced right. that actually were. So the next question has to do with the educational establishment. Yeah. Um, you're the classic example of the outsider who has the benefit of not being aware that there's been 20 years of data which says you're wrong, <laughs> right? Uh, and you've been pretty heavily criticized by people who I think are more jealous than anything else that you've done so well. Uh, it's obviously my bias. Um, what, what's the legitimate response from the educational institutions. Do you ultimately think that they, that they will embrace this model? Do you think that they will reject you? I mean, you have some experience. Yeah, and yeah. You, and you need teachers. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. you don't replace teachers in your model. Yeah, right? and I think, I think that hits it, I mean, that hits at a bunch of things. Uh, you know, one is some of the misperceptions that people are, might have or are having is uh, that, you know, when anything virtual shows up, that that's going to be in competition for the physical. You know, it's Amazon.com versus Barnes and Nobles. And every, from the beginning, obviously we're working in Los Altos, we talked about in the TED Talk, it's all about how does the virtual, yeah, if you have nothing else, it should be able to stand on its own, but how does that virtual supercharge what happens inside of the physical? And, uh, and I think sometimes the press narrative, they like this, you know, one man in a closet story and he's like fighting the establishment. And so that, that tends to be the narrative no matter what we try to do. But the reality is, is from day one, we were working deeply with students. I mean, in, in those early days, we had two people in the organization and we were working with four teachers and, and a bunch of administrators. And then we brought on, a third of our team is either former teachers, current teachers, and people who directly interface with teachers. We have 20,000 teachers using it in their classrooms really? um, uh, as we speak. And so it's, I think that that's one, just, just a misperception. I think some of the fair criticism is, you know, we get these great headlines because people like this story, uh, you know, the Messiah of math. Uh, one, one I liked in particular was the math of Khan, which I, <laughs> I, uh, I thought was, was quite good. Um, uh, but, you know, there are these grand headlines, you know, this revolution in education. And, and, you know, it's at some point we like that. It gets people onto the site, gets them engaged. It's, it's kind of validation. But it, it risks oversimplifying it. You know, and I think a lot of people come back like, no, there's no one, you know, there's no silver bullet. There's no panacea here. You know, it's just a possible tool that might, and, and that's something we agree with. We're at a very early stage of what we're doing. I mean, it's literally two years since we got our first funding. We're 36 people. We're not a big organization. Um, and we're constantly iterating on, on, on top of that. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think it's really healthy. I think it's good that we're getting this feedback, so, I call it. So, so the, the current breadth of your classes is 
largely analytical subjects, um, and you're sort of jumping a little bit into first year college. Yeah. Where does it go into, from a content perspective over the next, say, five years? What, what is your ambition? I, I think it's, it's a, uh, so on the video side, it's already quite comprehensive. And the videos actually go into even you know, the financial crisis or the Greek credit crisis, things like that. Uh, I, you know, I want to do a full MBA curriculum. We actually have a gentleman who's a... Uh, did you hear that? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. How long will it take you to do a full MBA curriculum? I think you have an MBA, so yes, you, yeah, so I have a sense. So you spent oh. two years doing an MBA. How long will it take? Yeah, you and, to do and I'll be fair. I mean, you know, the 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 the, the informational part of an MBA curriculum. So <laughs> there won't there won't be the pub crawls and all of that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> The, uh, no, obviously, I think what, what actually is really good, uh, you know, I, I cite that in the book about what's really good about business school is that it actually isn't about information delivery. It's actually about um, you show up to class to in, engage and you have these conversations. And so, yes, you do learn a little bit of accounting and finance, but you have the, the more important thing, you get all this experience from, from your, your class and, and from the professors. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, if we're talking, when I talk, say that I'm saying, you know, capital markets, corporate finance, um, basic accounting, what you, an MBA, the, the tools that an MBA would have, I think would take so, about so a semester. So what's the sort of uh, event horizon? Yeah. Um, what, are you going to teach literature? Are you going to teach fine arts? You know, where, where, where's the limit of your model? So I, I'm probably not going to be the person to teach these things. I might make a cameo every now and then. Uh, we actually have two art historians who are already uh, making videos. They've made 300 videos. And this is actually, it's an under, um, I actually was speaking at, for the, with, at the Crest Foundation, which is a very big sponsors of art history. And, and actually, I think we, we, can, we might be as influential on, on the museum side of things. Uh, the Google Art Project, uh, our two art historians were two of the primary voices on, on that. Uh, and, and they have more credible credentials than I do. One was a, a senior person at art history at the Pratt, and one was at, at the MoMA. Um, and, and so they've made some incredible art history videos. Uh, we, uh, I've done a few history videos. We're thinking about how can we do more things in the humanities. And a really interesting thing is how do we do the interactive portion in the humanities. It's one thing to do videos, but we really want to do interactive content across the board. And, and I think our computer science, ironically, is kind of the direction that we would go in. Our computer science platform, you can go code, you can see how the, you get feedback, but you save a portfolio of your works. It's like, like any artist. You would create a portfolio of your works, you get feedback from everyone else, eventually people will be able to rate your stuff. And so we imagine doing the same thing for writing assignments or for uh, po poetry, or you can even compose music on the site, and then other people can rate how good that music is. And get your computer science app is an example where you actually have little JavaScript programming activity. Yeah. So that's a that's a variation of your model already. That's already yeah exactly. I mean we're not just about videos. We're not just about those original interactive exercises which we continue to build. Computer science was to show no. We're serious about really deepening the level of learning that you can have here. And it's not just lectures on computer science. It's actually a project in environment where you can fiddle around and play with things. For everybody's benefit, I think um, many people don't understand how much a role Google has played in in a lot of this movement. And I, I'd let everybody know, because I'm very, very proud in, in the typical sort of Google bottom-up kind of way, without a lot of sort of coordination, the following things occurred. Peter Norvig and Sebastian Thrun sort of cap, cap, uh, catalyzed the entire um, sort of large educational thing with a series of AI classes and so forth done at Stanford um, at the university level. We've been working with Coursera and helped her uh, and that whole team get going uh, at Stanford. Of course, we helped helped you financially, and you were going to do well without us, but we helped maybe a little bit. Um, we've done a bunch of, of these open courses on search and developer things for our kind of technical audiences, and we're getting some experience with all of these. We, of course, are, are quite horizontal in terms of infrastructure and so forth for our kinds of things. Um, what do you think? Um, what do you think that the sum of you, right? you and the five other sort of very, in my view, courageous groups, how would you rate where you are, right? Are you, you it's still, it's only been a couple of years. Yeah, and actually, I mean, this, the MOOC world is massively open online course. I mean, this is very new. This is, I think, the, those first pr courses were last year. 150,000 students. Yeah. Uh, universities go crazy. Right. Yeah. They're not quite sure what to do about this. People are just love the information. And, and I think there's some really exciting stuff. I think, you know, and actually, it should, it should probably rewind back to 
the, I guess you'd call it, you know, Web 1.0 in the late 90s, you know, uh, people were thinking about online ed from then. Uh, MIT, I think, was a, the, the first to step out and do open courseware, and, and to a large degree that inspired Khan Academy. Khan Academy came out and showed, look, there's, there's a lot of traction here if the form factor's right, if it's, if it's digestible chunks, if there's interactivity to it. Um, and that, you know, that's been cited as inspiring some of this next wave, Coursera, Udacity, and then and also edX, MIT and Harvard are doing it, and, and, and Berkeley. I mean, and, do you think that, that 10 years from now this will all be old hat and everyone, do you, how much does, does it change over the next decade? I mean, I, if this is version one, presumably version two, version three, version four of your work and their work is quite different. I think there's going to be elements of what we're already seeing in 10 years from now, but I think it will be dramatically different. I think what's going to be really exciting about 10 years from now is that all of these things are going to, you know, right now all of them are on the learning side of, you know, education is this mix of things. It's not just learning. It's the main focus of education, but it's also socialization and it's credentialing. And right now all of them are tackling the learning side. Some of these MOOCs are giving these certificates, but they're not mainstream credentials that, that have economic value or they're authenticated. Um, I, I think what you're going to see, you know, this MOOC stuff has been great for us because we're like, okay, we're doing this asynchronous model where people can jump in. If they want a full narrative, they can chain them together. There is a community. But they're, and, and we're able to reach, you know, we're at close to 7 million uniques right now per month. But they're doing something slightly different. They're doing a synchronous model, which is around a classroom. It creates right. these cohorts. It's effects. a much more structured classroom model exactly. but using the virtual. And, but they get the people who, the 100,000 or, you know, sometimes 20 or 30,000 who finish, they're deeply, deeply, deeply engaged and they feel like they're part of something. And so we're learning a lot by observing them. I think it's going back, you know, we're saying how can we get the best of that and I think they're saying well how can we get the best of the asynchronous. I think you're going to see things that, you know, things like Khan Academy where you could take flights together where it's like hey there's a, there's a trip on algebra at this pace. I think the different pacing is important because people have other stuff to do in their life or they just learn differently. Um, there's a cohort of 100 people leaving tomorrow. You want to join. If there's enough people there could be a whole cohort it's leaving a travel, in 10 minutes. It's a exactly. Travel. And then you have that cohort effect. I think the biggest the biggest thing we haven't talked about yeah. is your impact internationally. Google, of course, funded yeah. uh, the localization work, and you're busy expanding that to many different languages. Uh, it must be very satisfying to feel that people who literally have no textbooks are really reliant on you. Yeah, it, it's been incredible. You know, we've been doing this translation project for a while, and obviously people have been consuming it in English as well, and there's been these NGOs who've been taking the content and putting it on, at least just the video content, putting it on DVDs and thumb drives and taking it into villages and whatever else. Uh, but the, the translation, we've just surfaced a lot of the videos that were done, primarily funded with that initial Google grant. If you go to the bottom of any of the Khan Academy pages on the footer, there's a little drop down. It says English, you drop down. There's, uh, I think, 900 videos in Spanish, 900, close to that in Portuguese. Portuguese, Arabic, Bengali, Hindi, Urdu, uh, Russian, French, and so we're starting to, to get the international side. And probably the best story that we've heard, there's a group from Cisco Systems who they've been going and installing computers with, with broadband in orphanages throughout Asia. And uh, they set up one in this orphanage in Mongolia, and there's this 16-year-old uh, girl, Zaya, who started using it on her own, super brilliant. We've talked to her, them about Zaya. And she's now our prime translator into the Mongolian language. My God, um, out of the orphan. Yeah, this is like, you know, straight out of like Diamond Age. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, the book is the, the One World Schoolhouse, and it's coming out in the next week? No, it came out Tuesday. Tuesday, yes. okay, so it's just coming out, yeah, yeah, yeah. it in the back. And you're going to do a Google Hangout for us on the 17th, right? That's right. So try to promote this. I think it'd be interesting with this kind of an audience to ask people for their questions or comments on this or anything else. I hope you all understand why I think this may be the most, in person, most important person we meet over the next year or two. Sal Khan, go ahead. Yeah, by the way, just let me say thank you. My daughter actually three, three and a half years ago started using some of your stuff when she was in high school. And it, oh, was, great. it was great. That she and is this it. because the, 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 it was a supplement? Yeah, there were questions. Uh, she'd actually transferred from England. I wasn't happy, and she wasn't happy with what she'd learned in that school system coming into the school system here, and she was able to catch up on some things she didn't understand uh, by using Khan Academy. It was, it was marvelous. Uh, there wasn't an alternative. But listen, let me ask a question here. And the, the, sort of the whole flipped, uh, flipped classroom idea, you know, uh, is, 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 is a fascinating one and I think is going to turn out to be very important as we've already seen. But I wonder if there isn't another kind of flipping that, that we can do here, a really important one. The process that your system enables, essentially allowing everybody to move at their own pace 
and then with the various testing and monitoring systems, essentially uh, sort of getting us to the point where we can pretty much be sure that if somebody goes in the program and stays in the program, they will come out after some amount of time knowing at least some minimum. I mean, we'll be able to pretty much say, you know, here's, here's a goal. Everybody's going to get at least that far. Some may go farther, but everybody should at least get this uh, so far, which is not the way the systems work today. But this introduces, I think, an interesting opportunity to switch things, and that is switching the grading or switching the measuring. Today, what we do is we focus a lot on, on measuring the kids, the students, determining whether or not they're any good. But if we have a process that pretty much says that if you follow the process, everybody gets to the same point, unless there's something fundamentally wrong, it seems that we ought to be flipping the grading and focusing more on testing and grading the teaching system because um, we know what the end result will be for the students. The students will all know the stuff. The question now is how effective is the teaching system at getting them there? How quickly can I get them there? How pleasant can I get them there? So is it, can we see in the future a, a flipping in the, in the testing away from testing the students to testing the system? Yeah, and, and obviously, uh, well, I think there will be interesting things there because you get a much richer data narrative, uh, Pierre, where it's not even just snapshot assessments of, of the students, you can actually see how they're progressing. You can statistically say, oh, these are similar cohorts. This one seems to be progressing faster. What are the variables that are, that are or maybe we haven't identified all the variables that are different. What are they and how can we make other cohorts perform the same? Um, you know, in, in assessing, you know, I, I, that's, we haven't given deep thought to that, uh, but you know, I, I, it, I guess it would be possible. Uh, I mean, it brings up something that early on one of my friends uh, threw out, which at first seemed like a really crazy idea, but when he thought about it, well, why, why not? He's like, well, why we should have uh, outcome-based tuition, where instead of it based on you know <laughs> how much year, if we can get you to this level of competency, you'll pay 18 years of tuition, um, <laughs> and we're and you're all better off because it only took three years, you know. So, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, it, it, it does. It does lead to that interesting thing, and you know, to the first part of your comment about the, the flipping, which, you know, in, in the book I go, I, I talk. We could go even further than that. The flip is still kind of within this Prussian model that we inherited from a country that does not exist. You know, this assembly line model where we literally have, you know, you literally put these students in these age batches, and it's literally an assembly line. I mean, we don't think of it that way, but they're moving at a set pace. At every station, something is applied to them a little bit. It gets different grades and at different points. You're like, oh, that's you know, that's a good cranberry. That's a bad cranberry, and and that's going to be you know for Whole Foods or whatever, and that's going to go someplace else. And um, and 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 what we're, we're and we're saying, no, this is this is silly. Just get to that outcome where everything is is a, is a good outcome. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think the, the the in the near term, what I'm most excited about in terms of real, and I think this is actually going to happen when you talk about five, ten years, it's the first sign that that the cracks are emerging in in, in the old model. But everyone's improving. Is um, I think everyone across the board is funny, is fundamentally questioning should they be giving a lecture anymore? Finally, uh, you know, I was on a, a panel with John Hennessy at, of Stanford, and he, you know, we hadn't talked about it or anything, but he on stage said, "Look, we're seriously looking at whether we." really need to give any lectures anymore. That when people gather, it's not that they're, they're not going to say people shouldn't gather together, but when they gather together, it shouldn't just be like taking notes and you don't know the other people in the room. It should be interacting with each other. It should be getting help from the professor and the TAs and everybody else. So teaching will no longer be a performance art? It, yeah. Uh, I, I, unless you have a YouTube channel. I, I would encourage you to consult the leader of the Chicago Teachers Union as to timing. Uh, yes, yes, sir. So it's very impressive, of course, what, you, what you've done. I had two questions. The first is um, your point about being able to look at remedial stuff is, is great. Uh, in your videos, do you have like pop-ups or overlays that show the topics that students might want to read up on during, the, uh, during that topic? Like during, when you're doing algebra and adding, say, fractions with, you know, with unknowns, can you, is there a quick link to get uh, to adding fractions the problems, the problem dinner. Yeah, and, and this is something that, so the simple answer is yes. Uh, and, and the more complex answer is we think it's not ideal the way the site is set up right now. The, the way the site, you know, the videos kind of took a life of, of their, in, in the old days actually the videos were there to complement the problem sets. So the way I viewed it is, oh, I'm, this thing generates problems for you, it can give you hints if you need it. And if you really need it, you might need a video. Because I, I used to say, hey, the hints are probably good enough for you to, to, to give, that's how I used to tutor my cousins. Give them a problem, if they had a little trouble, I'd give them a little intuition or a little hint. Um, and then later the videos took a life of their own, and then later when we got 
resources, we started investing again in the, the problem generator. And so our problem has been the, the connections and the narrative and where do people do go. And we're starting to do that curation process. You can do it already. They both already exist and there are linkages. They're not ideal right now. Uh, we're, we're, uh, what we're launching and trying to kind of get the best of the MOOC world and the, the asynchronous world is we're calling them tutorials. So a tutorial in our mind, it's not a semester commitment. It's a collection of things that is roughly a one hour to one week commitment uh, that's around an idea like photosynthesis or entropy or whatever it might be. It's some, you know, it'll be video, video, exercise, computer science, simulation, video, video, exercise, community or open-ended thing. And so yeah, that, the, the goal is exactly that. I mean, but things like fractions, they already are connected. If you watch the, if you do the fraction exercises, the videos there, the videos there, the fraction exercises. Yes, sir. So thanks for a great interview. Um, to expand on one of the previous questions, one of the biggest impacts that a teacher can have on students is not delivering information, but to inspire them to actually make them interested in the subject. How do you envision your um, work helping them do that? Yeah, so we can, I mean, there's, there's, there's a, a couple of dimensions here. I mean, on, on the simplest dimension, what we saw at Los Altos even two years ago is we did it just by giving them the, the room to do it. You know, you take that lecture out of the room and you actually take a lot of the, administ you know, the administration out of the room in terms of grading homework and you take that out of the room, now all of a sudden a, a teacher has what they want to do with the classroom and, and some of those, uh, you know, uh, the teachers that we worked with, they were incredible. They, they had a list of things that they really wanted to do. They were doing these really interesting projects that were inspiring. They were, they were like, look, for the first time I'm able to spend some time with every student in the classroom. Literally just talking to someone on a personal level is inspiring them, I mean, as opposed to being, being distant from them. But on top of that, we do realize, you know, we've been saying, hey, class time should be used for interaction, it should be used for projects. Um, projects are not a trivial thing. It's, it's very easy to have bad projects, cookbook projects. Uh, and so that's why we, 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 we wanted to put resources into this computer science, because it's so general, it can be used in anything. You know, I just made a video for, uh, Le LeBron James literally reached out and said, I want to help make math videos. Um, <laughs> and, and, and this, this never happens. This, <laughs> This, this okay, never it's like happened. the fifth thing that never happened. This is the fifth thing that never happened. Did he call you or did you call him? No, he called us. He, I mean, his people called my people. But <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, but there, he, he, one of, you know, and, and he asked these interesting questions related to bath. One of them is, you have 30 seconds left, down by three. Is it better to shoot the three or take the two, foul, hope for another possession? Um, these, and, are, and these are problems that have occupied him for some yes, time. Yes, well, it's a core, it's a core <laughs> problem, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's funny because at first I was like, oh, I'm going to make a video for it, and I, I started doing like a decision tree for it, you know, and all of this. And actually, this, the second scenario gets quite complicated based on did they make one freeze, how much time went off the clock and all that. And I was like, oh, well, I have this great computer science tool now, so I did a Monte Carlo simulation for, for LeBron James. Um, and, and it, this has also never happened. This, is, this has also... <laughs> This has also never happened, but it's exciting because then we've gotten all these letters from very young kids. It's a Monte Carlo simulation is a very simple thing, actually, and uh, immediately it started sparking their imagination about a million different things. There's so much sports statistics out there. You can leverage those sports statistics, and now that you have a pretty easy-to-use uh, coding platform to do some really, really interesting kind of decision analysis, and frankly, stuff that I don't think even some of the people in the, you know, the, the head offices of some of the sports teams have, have actually done. Go ahead. So... You've done some amazing things helping people actually learn stuff, and that's mostly what schools do. But they do one other thing that's important, which is they certify that this person has a reasonable knowledge of this topic. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on uh, fixing or improving the system of standardized testing. Yeah, I mean, it's really what you're talking about is credentialing. How do, we, how do people prove to the world that they've learned something now that there are all these great resources to actually learn? Right. And, uh, I think there's a bunch of interesting things here. I mean, there's a big movement, and a lot of these things have always been out there. People have talked about it, but now there seems to be some traction. It, it's generally called competency-based learning. Instead of it being based literally on seat time and then you just get promoted, look, you take as long as you need, and when you feel you're ready, you go take a, a proctored exam. It should be a rich exam. It could be even an oral exam, and you prove, prove that you actually know it. And, and I, I frankly think that's going to be especially powerful at the uh, higher education level. Um, and one thing that I'm, I'm particularly excited about, and I'd be you know, interested in, in collaborating with any of y'all that want to work on something like this, uh, I think computer science is actually the, the, the ripest fruit there because you know, we, we hire on a much smaller scale than, than you guys, but we are also looking for you know, incredible people. And you know, when we look at uh, GPAs, great universities, it has 
it, you know, it's a filter, uh, and, and we probably have a lot of false negatives. There's a lot of great people. You know, John Resig, he's the world's you know, most known JavaScript programmer, wrote jQuery. Uh, he joined, you know, in this cover letter, he literally wrote, I, I wrote, you know, I, I started jQuery project or whatever, and I was like, oh, I guess we should interview him. Um, <laughs> but, but, his, uh, but later I asked him, I said, you know, where'd you go to school? He said, Rochester. I said, oh, is this a good school? And, you know, but what was your GPA? 1.9. And, or he I, was I, too busy yeah, programming Yeah, it might have been 2.0. Don't quote me. I mean, I think it was 1.9 or 2.0. He might have been a little bit higher. But it was, it was not a resume that would typically make the cut at, at, a, at, at a Google or, a, or Khan Academy. Or, uh, uh, and, 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 but it, it pointed to me what's wrong with our process. And I said, why is your, you know, he's an off-the-charts brilliant guy, fun to work with, everything. What, what, what happened? He's like, well, I was working on jQuery. Um, and, and, and so we're missing those people, unless, unless they do something really off the charts like, like what he did. And so I think there should be independent process, you know, where, where, and, and then when you go and actually get an interview here, we all make you go to the whiteboard and like write bubble sort, or you know, how do you sort this, or how do you find the edge of this boundary, or whatever, and it's inconsistent, some are hard, some are easy. Some, there might be some great people who just have anxiety coding at a whiteboard in front while someone's watching them. Um, and so I think there is something that could be done where people go take a, uh, maybe a proctored or, or at least authenticated uh, series of challenges, and that that's used as really a, a, a credential or a filter for, for people like us to, to see where the talent is. Did you have a question? Yeah. Hi, Sal. Thanks for everything you do. Um, so at Google, we get to work with a lot of great teachers who are forward thinking and not afraid of your model, not afraid of employing the flipped classroom and being more of a guide on the side. But there are a ton of teachers who are afraid of what you're doing. They feel like, you know, okay, if this happens, they're all going to take away our jobs. Um, and they're the gatekeepers to the kids. So how do you reach those teachers and how do you reach, by extension, those kids? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the main point is, is kind of, actually, that was a, one of the, the main hopes of this book, is, is to make it clear that it's not about, uh, because so much of, as was, was talked about before, teaching was viewed as a performance art before. And so people, it was kind of ingrained in people that that's where the value was. And to kind of, I think, get more people thinking in this direction is for everyone to realize that that isn't where the value is. And this isn't just lip service. The value really is on working deeply with students, mentoring them, forming connections with them. And I think when you, when you phrase it in that way, most, most teachers really get it. And whenever I talk to you know, people, this isn't an assault on you. I mean, I think, unfortunately, most of the public debate is an assault on teachers, and they group them all together, and they make all sorts of, you know, sweeping statements. This is an assault on a system that has been constraining you. It's, you know, whenever people get worried, you know, the U.S. is right behind Estonia when kids, when it comes to factoring polynomials, all's going to, you know, fall apart now. Um, the, the reaction from government is, let's put more tests on it. Let's put, it. and, and there's, you know, there's a rationale to that, and it might de-risk some of the, the worst performing situations, but it also completely handicaps everyone else. And it makes our system, frankly, more Prussian. It makes it more rigid, more, more controlled. And, and everything that we're trying to promote, and this is what we, I tell every teacher, and, and when, I think when they understand that, they get really excited about it, is about going back to the teacher really being able to define the experience uh, in really interesting, creative ways, but have tools that make sure that the academic rigor is still being achieved. You know, when I was uh, tutoring my cousins, this is what I wanted. There's all sorts of fun stuff I want to do with my cousins. I want to teach them about a Monte Carlo simulation, but at the same time, I also want to make sure that they are, they're reaching certain achievement goals, and so I, I can keep track of that asynchronously. I can kind of, uh, I, can, I can manage the chaos, so to speak. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, thank you. This is inspiring, and it's inspiring to the extent that I've, uh, uh, taken on a challenge to really change the way that I do a little bit of my own teaching. I have taught a citizen schools class for some time now, uh, since before I got to Google actually, uh, trying to teach sixth graders computer science and uh, algebra at the same time since the fundamentals are really kind There's of some together. So really very much, too, very, yeah. very yeah. core. And uh, in particular to try to motivate them uh, with a gaming context yeah. creating video games. The challenge that I have uh, that's not so much like the classroom, normal classroom challenge is one, the kids have to be really motivated on their own because there's no credit, there's no nothing, this is an after school activity. Yeah. If they're going to watch anything at home, they have to do it because they want to. Yeah. And two is I don't know that some of these kids from the Bronx have tools at home with which to go and view videos, to go and play with the computers 
uh, yeah. et cetera. Um, one, I'd like to sort of ask your advice on those kinds of challenges, but also I'd like to ask your advice really on just how to prepare videos that are that engaging for a sixth grade audience. What what are the things I should be paying attention to? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take the first. You know, in terms of access issues, that's a real issue. Um, you know, there's even been a school, a few charter schools where uh, the school was able to get you know laptops or, or computing devices to, to the students, but then they get beat up on the way home, and someone someone takes it from them. Mm -hmm. um, and and so the solution or the near term solution seems to be. Uh, keep the school open a little bit longer, have a computer lab, partner with the Boys and Girls Club, someplace where they can access it, and it's actually, I mean, which is essentially saying it's, it's actually hard for them to be able to access it at home. But that's okay, they're accessing it, and actually that serves a double purpose, and I write a lot about that. It's crazy that school ends two hours before parents come home. That it actually gives them, it fills in that gap, especially working, you know, where both parents are working, and uh, so it also solves that need. Um, in terms of, in terms of uh, the motivation, I mean, I, I think you're right, and that's another thing, you know, one thing I write about is getting rid of summer, summer vacation, not summer, I like the season, but the um, get, getting, getting rid of summer vacation, and, you know, immediately, you know, the people's reaction, oh, well, that's when I did my most, like, creative stuff, really self-directed things, that's when I went on this, you know, those are my best memories from childhood, and when I point out those best memories, and if you're lucky, you know, a lot of people just waste their summer, uh, but if you're lucky enough to have those experiences, that's actually what your full school day should look like, it should be much more, you set your goals, but you have mentors who are structuring them, who are, who are pushing, really how a, a lot of environments like this might work, um, who, are, who, are, who, are, who are pushing you forward. So, I mean, there's not a, a simple solution while there's kind of this hybrid, while there's this separate thing where it's like, hey, if you don't pass this t test tomorrow, you're gonna fail, and there's all these repercussions, and then you're trying to do something interesting, and it gets squeezed out, even though the students are probably more motivated to do what you, you're working on. It's probably more important for them in the long term, too, but it's hard. Um, in terms of the videos themselves, you know, this is the thing I, uh, you know, I, I famously, I think I've gotten a little trouble on a couple of networks where I, you know, where I say, well, I just, I, I sometimes don't know what I'm going to say before I make a video. And people say, oh my God, what, how, how irresponsible that video is going to reach millions of people. And, 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 and I think what I was saying is that the video itself should really be coming from you. It should be really you thinking out loud. It should be uh, very uh, conversational. It shouldn't be scripted. If, if, I mean, there are people who actually who do good scripted videos. They're able to read it very naturally and very in a quirky way. But, but my style is, is, is more conversational, down to earth, thinking it through out loud. Um, and, but I do put a lot of time on the preparation in terms of thinking it through, let's, distilling it in my mind. Let's, uh, let's try to sort of oh, yeah, speed yeah, yeah. this up a little yeah, bit. Just, yes, just as a one minor point, yeah. if there are a couple of people who want to join us, it would be awesome. We need one or two more. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Hi. So we had a chuckle about the Chicago Teachers Union reference, um, but between the teachers unions and the educational institutions, there's some serious roadblocks in the system. You're a small team of folks, so I'm wondering how we as parents and good community citizens can help um, further the cause of, of education reform? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, we have been a grassroots word of mouth story, uh, like Eric introduced. And so I think the more of that we get, the better. The, the more, I mean, nothing's more powerful than one parent telling another parent or one student telling another student and one teacher telling another teacher or one parent telling a teacher. So I actually think we are going to be a, a teacher and parent led grassroots thing. So, so for us, I would just say more awareness. S systems never self reform. Sort of, it's a bad lesson of life. They don't self-reform. It requires external pressure. So my answer is, that my blunt answer is, the educational system is run for the benefit of the adults and not the children in aggregate, and that it's our responsibility as parents uh, to get that fixed somehow. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I just want to say first, thanks so much for coming. You're a huge inspiration to me, uh, and it's great to have people like here, you here at Google. Um, I, before I started at Google, I was an educational consultant, and one of the things we really promoted was the use of Chromebooks with Khan Academy as a cheap, effective way to have an effective learning suite. Um, and the teachers were really into it. Where we ran into problems was the actual institution itself, uh, because schools are, they get money from government based on test score results, et cetera. Uh, what are the reforms that you think need to happen? What's, like, what do you think, what, what's the timeline? Just help, please. Yeah, you know, I'm not an expert on kind of the, 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 the structural architecture of 
what might keep being on. There's weird things about things being blocked or laptop carts. And I mean, there's a lot of times we're like, look, this is obvious. You don't even need one laptop necessarily per child because they're not using them the whole day. So there's some way that maybe two or three could share one laptop. But there's a lot of weird structural things about how it's organized. I'm not an expert here. I think the best way is to really just show exemplars that are doing it really, really well. And, and I, and I want to thank the Chrome team for the donation that you and the other members made. It actually made a made a nice big difference for the Chromebooks. And obviously, we'll be doing more of that. I'm not on Chrome, but. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> but thank you. Thank uh, you for what but, you do. Okay. That's <laughs> Let, let's, let's run a little quickly. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm from a rural town in uh, South Carolina, and I've been trying to find ways to improve the school system there. Um, and I've looked into things like KIPP, but you know, they require just a complete overhaul. And I was wondering, but they do have sort of a training process for how to do this in other places. And I was wondering if in implementing Khan within the school, are you looking at having a training program for how this can be done and spread? Yeah, so we do have a team uh, that, that is interfacing with schools, learning from schools that their feedback comes back at, to, to our product, but then on top of that, they document what is working. If you go to khanacademy.org slash toolkit, that's where it's kind of the place for, for teachers or anyone who wants to kind of be a coach, really, run an after school program, anything, but, but how not, they could use it. She, she's exactly right. You need to have a little subsection, which is how to implement this if you're the yeah. school. No, that's right. Right, it, it needs to have that as its title. Yes. Right, just do this. Exactly. Right. Step one, step two. Yeah, so what we're trying to do is as much as possible self-service, and then they also do run workshops. Um, yes, sir. Our education system on all levels is full of really good teachers and also really bad teachers. Um, have you considered reaching out to those exceptional teachers who actually reach out to students who say, oh, wow, I love learning this stuff. This guy makes it make sense to me. Have you considered reaching out to these teachers saying, OK, these guys, this is the guy who should teach biochemistry, this is the guy who should teach maybe some subject that you're not an expert in, something yeah. like that. Are there any? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> there are many, uh, most. Uh, the, the, um, the simple answer is yes, absolutely. It's, so there's been a couple of, I guess, short-term things that we're doing. One, we do have this uh, contest. The, the close was October 2nd, and we're in process of kind of reviewing this next EDU guru with YouTube which is to find, uh, I think it's got, I mean, it's gotten several hundreds of, of applicants. So hopefully we find some, some interesting people there. And on our side, on our platform, one of the goals is this platform has been built around my content and now a few other people, Vi Hart, and, and we have our art historians. Uh, but it can be a generalized platform. And so we want to allow, hopefully in the next six months, anyone to start creating tutorials on our site. And then, um, and then maybe we can start to recognize the tutorials that are resonating with people and, and then maybe bring them into the fold. Let's have these be the last two, two questions. Yes, sir. Uh, first, thank you. Um, Khan Academy is the reason that my wife passed physics. Oh. Um, so Tell her to make a YouTube testimonial. I'll put it in the slide deck. I, I actually will. Oh, yeah. No, um, I'm serious. By the way, that, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, right. yeah. No, that's incredible. That's wonderful. Go ahead. Um, when you talk about the, the sort of the Prussian model, uh, the assembly line model of, um, of education, and that uh, the, the Khan Academy tools free up educators to sort of abstract away that, that portion of things so that they can focus on interesting projects and so on, um, how would you respond to the worry that if all the educational system is interested in is that assembly line aspect, that they could replace the entire school system? I mean, you, you mentioned that there, there's a significant worry that educators have that the entire teaching industry could, you know, we're all going to lose our jobs and so forth. And like c completely divorced from any intentions that, yeah. that you have, that by providing this really, really useful and wonderful tool, that this could be a negative impact. Like, how would you address that? Yeah, I actually think and that's a fascinating question. It's something we've thought about it is, you know, it's interesting because people always, well, what about this accrediting body and this is what the universities care about and these are, this is what the state standards are and all this. But if you really think, openly about the, 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 the whole ecosystem, the, the end consumer of whatever the, the system is, is are the Googles of the world, are the Facebooks of the world, are the, are the Goldman Sachs's, are the, the, the hospitals of the world. I mean, these are the, the firms of the world are, are the ones that are consuming it. And I think they've, if anything, been screaming for, yes, we want people with, that have shown competency in algebra and have good SAT scores. Yes, that's one dimension. But I think all of y'all recognize that we are looking for people who are capable of actually creating things. And our current system, I mean, you know, this is the biggest problem. We interview people with straight A GPAs from the top universities, and we say, what have you made? And they haven't made anything because they're too busy getting the, 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 the really good GPA. They're smart people. They're capable, but, but they didn't do it. Um, and so I think the fact, if we, if we collectively, as an ecosystem, start demand, and we are demanding it, 
um, then these will be valued. And you know, there, there's, there's two dimensions. There, one dimension is the academic achievement that's already there. And I think even there, the human component will always be super, super important. I mean, we can do one thing maybe for a very self-motivated student, just purely with virtual, they could do a lot. But having peers in your classroom to bounce ideas off and work with and having teachers that can mentor that will, will only supercharge that even more. Um, but the other two dimensions, which I think are equally or more important than that, that are not measured today, are how good are you at mentoring others and explaining to others um, and having empathy for others. And we could actually start to assess that with you know, peer-to-peer -peer review, uh, ratings, how much, how much time you're putting in on, on behalf of others. And that hopefully will be another kind of SAT score of the future. Um, another thing would be dimensions like perseverance, because now you have a data narrative. It's not just a snapshot assessment. Uh, you know, you had trouble, but did you persevere? To some degree, I might want the kid who took two months to learn negative numbers because he persevered as opposed to the person who just got it like that. Uh, and, and the last dimension is a portfolio of creative works. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank our you. final question. So you briefly mentioned uh, internationalization and translation. And I know it might be hard to get numbers or information from here, but um, what have you seen in terms of rural areas or areas in the developing world where there might not be a classroom or there might not be teachers? And are you getting good usage there? How is that changing things in those locations? Yeah, what's hard there is that's been the hard. That's obviously hard to measure because a lot of those are offline. Uh, but anecdotally, there's a lot of NGOs who are going out there and and taking the content and they tell us and they take pictures and you know that, that's all we can tell now. What will be exciting be over the next four or five years as the broadband or at least some level, it doesn't have to be broadband, it could be very low, broad, at least enough to keep track of what's going on. We will for the first time, you know, for the last hundred years people wanted to set up schools in a village and no one has any idea of what's happening. And I think what's exciting is in the next five years people will start to know what's happening. How, how are people engaging with the content? My, my sort of final question for you is we have all of Google here and, and through our video conference, as you know, around, around the company. Um, and obviously Google is a huge supporter of what you're doing for all the reasons that you see from the questions. What is the list of things that Google could do that would make you even more successful? Obviously, continue the success of YouTube. We're wiring up Kansas City. Maybe we can wire up some other cities. We use App Engine. so You use App Engine. Yes. Excellent. Okay, any complaints about App Engine? Yeah. No, so far, so good. So, so, so yeah. far, so good. Um, what are some other things Google could do to support you? Um, I, I don't know how frank I should be on this. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot I could, uh, but but no, I, I mean I, I think awareness is a huge thing. Yeah. I mean that's a, that's a, that's hopefully an easy thing. Um, I, I think feedback, I think there's ways that we could work together. I think you know, some of these things like creating credentialing architecture, I think, that's a, mm -hmm. I think that's a game changer if we could do it together. And obviously if we have people like Google want to help develop the credentials themselves. Yeah, we but have, also and the, we have a, a project called Course Builder, which is yeah. underlying infrastructure. So yeah. you might argue that that would be an extension of a yeah. Course Builder type project. Yeah, and, and, and Course Builder is on the learning, but this really like, okay, even if you didn't get a CS degree from anywhere, this is something that if you get through this series of things, Things, Google will take a serious look at you. Uh, you know, other software companies will take a serious look at you. And if you all do, the rest of the ecosystem will as so well. So we could sort of set that standard, and then everybody else would. Follow Everyone, it. I mean, I every like other company in the, in the in the world would, would take. But what do you thing. want the parents or future parents uh, in this room to do to change the school systems? Because most of these people in front of you don't really have a school choice. They have a public school. They may or may not have access to a charter school. Yeah, I mean. Uh, you know, as, as before, I think it's it, parents telling parents, raising awareness. I mean, if each of y'all went and told, you know, 100 people, it would be, it would be a pretty epic in terms of the awareness uh, that's happening. On top of that, I, I think there, there could be an element of if, if you can, uh, you know, talk to teachers that, that are in your child's life about this and tell them, look, this isn't about this replacing you. This is really, I think, something you're going and, to And enjoy. address their fears. It, address their fears. The fears are all obvious, and, and I think we've, we, we've discussed them. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and I think anything you can do to kind of push people's thinking, show examples of, of what can, can happen. Maybe you could self-organize and, and make your own little you know, boutique school that really pushes, pushes the envelope of things. But yeah, any of the above. So, so the book, of course, is The One World Schoolhouse coming out two days ago. <laughs> yes. um, not only have I read it, I've endorsed it. Uh, you should read it, too. Thank you very much. My true hero, Paul Kahn. Okay, thank you.